So Cricket Life Stories with me, Neil Kagram. Today we're talking about Ryan Sidebottom. Ryan, how's things going? Good, thank you. Yeah. Um, hi to everybody. Um, yeah, not too bad. Thank you. Obviously, weird, unprecedented times, but just trying to keep motivated and keep keep my, keep the mind active and keep busy. Yeah, that's what it's all about. So let's uh, take it take it all the way back with yourself. Was cricket your number one sport as a youngster? So I know you had a, oh, a football. Don't drop, don't drop me in it. You know what? Well, I, I don't know if any, anyone knows, but my father, um, Arnie, played um, both sports. Um, it was a time when you, you sort of pre-season, um, nothing overlapped. So he, he played football um, in the winters and, and cricket in the summer. Um, so I sort of always wanted desperately um, to follow in his footsteps and play football because um, he played for Man U um, from an early age. And, and, you know, having all these cuttings and watching him and, and seeing him in, in all the newspapers. And um, num I suppose number one was football for me, but I was never going to be good enough. Um, but I always loved cricket, you know, I was very sporty, uh, you know, coming from a sporting background. So cricket and football is the is the two. But unfortunately, my father's honesty as well said, look, son, you're not going to be good enough at, at football. Uh, you're not you're not quick enough. So the honesty obviously upset me a little bit. But he, he said you might have a talent at cricket and you might go, you know, a long way if you work hard and look after yourself. You did have some, am I correct in saying you did have involvement in uh, with Huddersfield or was it the, the, the yeah, trials with Huddersfield and Sheffield? Yeah, well, with sort of schoolboys, Huddersfield town schoolboys from sort of under under 11s to sort of under 15s. Um, and then I was on the YTS at Sheffield United for, for a short period. Um, but uh, again, I was playing cricket regular around that time, you know, England under 17s and, you know, Cricket, I knew in my heart that I, I could have a chance of, of making it in the game. So I had to sort of not give up football, but I had to just be careful and pick and choose because, you know, if you get injured at football, it, it could be a, a career-ending one. And, and then I would never have gone on and played cricket. So it was a tough decision, really, because, I you know, I really love my football, but it's just the way it is. So what was your first junior club side, cricketing, uh, cricketing club side? Yeah, so I was born and, and raised in Huddersfield. Um, I played a lot of Huddersfield League cricket. Um, my father, again, around that time, they had a lot of pros. You know, Yorkshire didn't play as much cricket as you do now. Um, so they had time to go and play league cricket and, and earn a little bit more money. Um, and dad played sort of in the Huddersfield Leagues here, here, there and all over. And I sort of just followed him. He proed at home for, for a number of years and I, I sort of played all the uh, schoolboy junior stuff at home for the cricket club. And then when did Yorkshire first spot your talents? And talk us through your path through the system that the junior set up and then all the way through. Did you play second team all the way through to second team cricket before making the, your pro debut? Well, we, weirdly enough, again, it, my story is a little bit different. I, I didn't really play much schoolboy cricket. Um, one, I, I wasn't selected. Um, two, I was supposed I was busy playing football as well. So in terms of under 12s, under 13s, under 14s, I, was, I suppose I was in and around Yorkshire schools cricket, but I didn't actually play that much until sort of 16, where I kind of, I grew and I got a little bit bigger and, and stronger. Um, and then George Batty, who is Gareth Batty's father, was the, I think he was under 17 Yorkshire coach. And he, he picked me in the team and I suppose I never looked back from there really. And then, I got opportunity to go work on the YTS at Headingley in the cricket, indoor cricket school um, for two years in the winters. And, and that was basically cleaning the toilets, um, doing all the groundsmen, the grafting, uh, sweeping the courts, um, which sort of stood me in good stead, really, you know, to, to do those things and, and coach cricket as well, at, you know, at a young age and, and sort of see how it is on the other side. Um, really helped me. Um, but yeah, I didn't play much schools cricket, never selected. You know, I was told um, from a young age that I wouldn't, you know, I shouldn't be, um, I should give up cricket. I should concentrate on something else. Um, and that's really upsetting. But again, having a, a dad who was open and honest and would sort of say, look, what do you want to do? You know, you have an opportunity to, to make it a cricket, but you need to be better. You need to work harder. Um, and that's what I did. 
you know, I might always not have been the greatest bowler in the world, but I, I really worked hard and gave it absolutely everything when I was out there. Yeah, that's a story of resilience in itself. So would it be fair to say if any youngster facing a similar situation, would your advice be just to keep at it, keep working hard and keep believing? Yeah, don't, you know, yeah, keep believing in yourself, be positive and, and you know, don't give up on your dream so easily. Um, you know, you see in football, don't you? You look at your likes of your Jamie Vardy's who have played, you know, all the lower league football and look where he is now. And and I think that is the beauty of sport. It isn't just about maybe going to public school or um, playing all junior cricket right through and then playing for, you know, there's lots of different stories. And and for me, you know, that that is, I suppose, great for other people to hear. You know, Charlie Strecker was with at Nottinghamshire, you know, he was just playing league cricket in Cornwall and Knotts happened to, to tour there for a few few games and they picked him up and you look at the sort of county career he's had and what a you know great bowler he's been and I suppose that's the beauty of sport. You can come from anywhere and don't give up on your dream, you know, always believe in yourself and, and be positive. And then what did it mean to you to make your Yorkshire debut? So 97? 97, mass- massive, you know, massive players in the dressing room, all internationals you, you've got your Craig Whites, Darren Goff, um, David Bias, you know guys you sort of you know you're in and around or you see playing regular for Yorkshire and it was a you know a dream come true you know you always grow up dreaming of uh, you know having having that emotional start to your career and, and playing for Yorkshire and representing the county you know it's a big county and you know as you know a lot of big players have come from Yorkshire and uh, you're under pressure and it was, yeah, it was a great debut, loved every minute and, yeah, very fortunate and lots of fond memories. And yeah, then early on in your professional career, you really shone. Was it the, in 99 and 2000, you got the Dennis Compton Award, which is which was awarded to, like, one of the young cricketers of, of, of the year? Again, were you just showing that, that confidence of youth back then? I, I think I was quite raw and inexperienced, but I, you don't really... You don't get nervous. You just go out there and, and enjoy. You know, you're with these big players, but you you just go out and try and do your best and perform. You know, same with England under 19s. That probably set me off on the, you know, on my career. You know, I took a load of wickets in against Zimbabwe in a Test series, and you had, you know, Flintoff, um, Gareth Batty, um, Alex Tudor, where Shah, um, some great, you know, some big names in in cricket. Um, and, you know, I performed really well and I thought that gave me the confidence to go on and once I started playing first class cr- cricket, I felt good. And your England debut, 2001, what did it mean to you to get the call up? Do you remember who gave you your cap and that feeling of walking out when the three Lions? I, th- I think it was, I'm not sure, I think it was, na- might be Nasr saying honestly, so long ago, but very... Um, it was it was a weird one because at the time I'd, I'd not played a lot of county cricket. I'd done well. Um, we I went on an air tour to the West Indies, and again you had a lot of England players that had already experienced, you know, had England honours, and I outperformed everyone, and I got picked probably on the back of that. But actually, when I came home that summer, I, I wasn't bowling that well. I was massively out of form, and I think I got picked on the back of you know a good England air tour. So going into that game, I wasn't feeling good. Um, I wasn't bowling how I, how I could. Um, and I actually didn't perform that well, um, all honesty. And uh, But again, you know, you have ups and downs in sport. And it, it sort of gave me another kick up the backside in terms of, you know what, I, I really need to improve at, on every level. You know, my fielding, um, my batting, um, you know, my bowling. I need to swing the ball more and, and do more with the ball and... and get a bit stronger and you know you can go one of two ways you can let it affect you and go oh actually I didn't perform my debut wasn't very good but actually I, yes it wasn't but I was honest with myself and said look it wasn't very good but actually this is what I need to do to improve so it, you know it, it probably helped me in the long run you know having a bad day de- England debut you know it wasn't great. There's a lot of talk around that time as well about Duncan Fletcher's philosophy when it came to the attack that went out on the field and there's a lot said about him him thinking that for international cricket, you needed to be able to bowl like 90 miles per hour plus. Now, did what, did that kind of affect you in the term, in the sense of like, 
knowing that was in the back of the coach's mind or was it just solely your focus on your own performance and knowing well, as weirdly you said, enough, about yeah. getting better? Weirdly enough, he never said two words to me during that test match. He never spoke to me, so I, I, I couldn't really tell you. Um, it was a weird one. Um, it, of course, you, you don't really think about, you know, that those kind of comments. I, I think, look, I, I'm a swing bowler by trade and, and you look at a lot of swing bowlers now in world cricket, they're the most successful ones. You know, Jimmy has been amazing, hasn't he? And he's probably dropped a little bit of pace, but he still swings a ball around. And I think for players now, of course, 90 miles an hour, it, it's a luxury and you want that in your side. But I think, you know, you need to do something with the ball. And, and I went away from that test match thinking I need to swing the ball more and, and do more with it. And, and I just worked on angles and um, seeing positions rather than thinking, oh, I need to ball 90 miles an hour because I was never going to. Yeah, so just picking up on that point in terms of just mastering your craft, say the youngsters watching this and saying, oh, they want to improve like their actual swing bowling. Was it more subtlety of wrist, grip position? What kind of specifics were you working on away from the away from the cameras? Lots. Of, I mean, one one thing I used to do, I used to have a big load up and I used to put it behind my head. And, and with that, you, you know, you look at the angle now of my elbow, I've got to work really hard to get back in line. So for me, it was all trying to get straight and up. Um, so rather than throwing it behind, was throwing it up towards the batter. And now you look at my wrist position, whereas if you look at my wrist position here, um, you know, the difference, and all of a sudden my wrist was right behind the ball and I could swing it so much more. Uh, and also it was working on my angles, uh, again, wrist position, what works for me. Uh, and also... A big thing what I see, even see now when I do a little bit of coaching is the kids, you know, they turn up and have fun. And and look, that is number one. You want kids to enjoy what they're doing. But I practice properly. You know, when I practiced, I would, I would go into a 20 minute practice session and think, right, what do I need to work on? Is it my wrist? Um, what my line of length, my angles? Um, I'm playing against, I don't know, someone next week who struggles round the wicket. So I would... I would practice properly. You know, I wouldn't just turn up and think, oh, I'll just turn up and have a 20-minute net because I, I felt I wouldn't improve that way. So, I, one, I worked really hard on my um, wrist position uh, and also my load-up, making sure I'm a little bit straighter. And then, secondly, I practiced properly to, to learn um, rather than just turn up and having a net. And then how much did you actually also practice going over the wicket and then around the wicket, obviously, as a left-hander? Did you feel that you will still be able to um, swing the ball as effectively. What kind of drills were you working on so that, you know, that art was perfected as well? I think when I, when I first started, you know, a lot of, there wasn't many left armers around. So over the wicket, you know, swinging it back into the right-handers, you cause so many problems because then the angle, you know, if the ball just nips across, you then, you're beating both sides of the bat. So I didn't bowl round the wicket that much. Um, but as... You know, as techniques get better and, you know, batsmen get better and especially, you know, the introduction of the short formats with T20s, I think batsmen's techniques have changed. So probably coming round the wicket, then I had to practice and, and work on that side. Um, so it was sort of evolution, really. I had to change how I sort of bowled and, and practiced um, and, and the angles. And um, so that was later on in my career. So it just shows it. It is, you don't just do it straight away. You need to work on, on something that you're going to improve on. And then domestically, 2001, you win the championship with Yorkshire. Again, how did that make, how was that as a moment in your career? Yeah, amazing. I mean, what a, you know, you, you play the game to do your best and, and try and get, you know, England honours and, and have, a, have a long career. But to win trophies is, is just you know, along the way is amazing. And, you know, the first trophy that I'd ever won and been part of a team, you know, the team performance, how we played as a team. And it was at Scarborough as well, you know, the home of cricket, as the second home of cricket as Yorkshire fans, you know, near the seaside, there was probably, what, seven, six, seven thousand fans um, there watching us. And, yeah, to, to win the county championship and was something very special. But I, weirdly enough, we probably should have won it two and three times in a row with the team and the bowling attack that we had. But we, 
we sort of rested on our laurels a little bit and and we probably celebrated too much and thought, you know, the next year we will be world bees and we'll just go out there and do it. And it again, the beauty of sport, the you know, mother cricket actually thinks totally differently. Um, so, yeah, 2001, we should have won 2002, 2003, but we didn't. And then the move to Notts a couple of years later, what were the reasons behind that? Was there, were there playing reasons involved? Um, talk us through it. Yeah, in, in, in life, the, there's decisions, you know, whether you make them wrongly or rightly. That was the best decision I've ever made in my career, um, to move to Notts. Uh, I wasn't sort of playing regular with Yorkshire. Um, I was performing well. Being con- I'd always been pretty consistent throughout my career. Um, but when you've got your Goffs, Craig Whites and Hoggards and players coming back from internationals, I was one to miss out quite a bit or I didn't bowl that much when I was playing. Um, so I, I needed to make the move. It was a decision that I didn't take lightly. Um, but I thought to, to improve as a person and as a cricketer, I needed to get away and, and sort of stand on my own two feet a little bit more and, and brush aside that history with my father and everything that, that I'm associated with Yorkshire um, to go and, and do something and put myself under pressure. And it was a great move. You know, I bowled open the bowling in all formats, T20, one-day cricket. And I certainly, look, the first two or three years, I improved so much as a cricketer. You know, when you've got um, Stephen Fleming as captain, uh, Dave Hussey, Mark Elam, you know, experienced international. He was like my second dad. You know, I've, I've said it in a lot of interviews. He he really got me thinking about the game in terms of not on the field, but afterwards we would have a lot of conversations in the bar or over a coffee. Um, just talking about, he would question my Howard Bold on that day. He'd be like, what did you do? Why didn't you come around the wicket? Why didn't you go wide on the crease? Uh, and he would really get me thinking um, about the game. And he, he helped me massively. He, he really did improve my game because I, I became more of a thinking bowler as well then. I wasn't just a, a bowler who turned up and try, and try and put it in his spot. He really got me thinking about the game. And since, once I moved to Notts and I had two or three years with Mark Elam, I, my cricket, you know, improved you know, massively. Obviously, Headingley and Trent Bridge, known in the UK, that really swings around a lot. So as a swing bowler yourself, how did you choose which end you bowled? At home, and then obviously when you go away, you're less accustomed to uh, to the ground. Obviously, you played. You must have played. You play there once every year. But then, how do you? Get, is it just a rhythm thing that you just pick up in practice, and then yeah, it's, you have a spell, it's a and then feel. yeah, it's a feel thing. I mean, at Headingley, I, I love bowling up the hill because I felt bowling down the hill. I, I got carried away and I ran too fast, and I, I wasn't holding my action strong enough. And sometimes I didn't swing it. Whereas up the hill, you had to you know, you sort of landing before you let go of the ball. So I found that. And a lot of players actually at Yorkshire didn't want to, did not want to bowl um, up the hill. So it was great for me because, he, you know, I had bowl all day, which, I, you know, I love doing. And then at Knott's, really, it was just a, probably p- the pavilion end, which I enjoyed more. But actually, it's on specific days. Again, it's just a feel, a rhythm thing. You know, you might not have a rhythm at one end and you change to the other end and all of a sudden it just clicks like that. And and again, that's the beauty of being a bowler. You know, every day is different. Is there any advice you can also give to kids and young professionals? That if it's actually swinging too much, you just don't also get carried away. So you see, like the commentators mentioned, sometimes it does hoop around. It's almost like a, a show delivery, but it's not really like doing much in terms of attacking the batsman. Any kind of advice you can give on that side of things? Again, if you... You, I think a new batsman you've got to make him play you know most dangerous time is first 20 balls for for any batter you know they're not probably moving their feet they've got to get accustomed to the light the wicket the pitch you know the ball moving around and and if you are swinging it a lot you know, just take stock at the end of your run up and maybe change your angle maybe start off a little bit have a bit more of an angle if you're swinging too much or Maybe you might be getting too close to the wickets and you're swinging it from the arm. So again, it's just, it's learning those things. One in nets and also the experience of playing in matches is not get carried away. And, and also, you know, I think sometimes now with the skills of T20 cricket, 
a lot of young kids have every skill in their armory and they try and show it within the first two overs rather than what happened to the old fashioned hit the pitch hard, try and get the batsman out. And if he tries to hit you off your length, maybe change then. But I think, yeah, young kids now just want to bowl every delivery before they've actually mastered bowling four balls in the same area. I mean, I get it a lot with the kids that I coach. You know, they all want to bowl. I want to bowl a slow ball now. I want to bowl a leggy. And I'm like, yeah, but you have a, you can't hit the same spot three times in a row. So for me, how are you going to get better or, or go to the next level? So it, it's also working on the basics, the line and lengths and, and your run up and your rhythm and your angles. And then 2005, you win the championship with knots. Again, how was that as a moment in your career? Obviously, you mentioned that you're opening the bowling in our forefront in the team. Again, must have been a special feeling. Yeah, I mean, I've been lucky enough to win, you know, win five county championships throughout my career. But I would say that is the most special. You know, you look at India today, you know, a run chase like that, you on day five, day five pitch, you would give probably the batting team no chance. It would happen one in a million. And this specific game, we I think we were level on points with maybe Somerset and Durham or, or Somerset. And it rained for three days. And on the last day, we needed to get 400 and three wickets to win the championship. And we did. Uh, it, honestly, it was just the most surreal day ever. We we smashed it everywhere. I think Adam Voges and, and got 140. Samit got, Patel got 100 and... Chris Reid got a quick fire 80 and I think we had like 12 overs to get three wickets. And also in the Lancashire team, there was Chandra Paul who got 10 million runs that season against us and we could not get him out. And then uh, Andre Adams just nicked him off and, you know, to get three wickets and 400 on, on a day is, oh, I mean, so special. And, and you could see that, you know, the celebrations with the boys, it, it meant everything and to win another championship on that, that that way was awesome. In 2007, when you're back in the test fold, how important was Peter Moores in, in your career at that stage? Massive. Huge, huge, huge. A, a great, great man manager, um, you know, would speak a lot about the game, very knowledgeable. But for me, he got the best out of me because he just, he spoke to me like a human being. He... He wanted me to do well. Um, if there was any negatives, he would he would sit down and just tell me open and honestly and say, "Look, this I think you could do this better. I think you could do that better." But really, he was he was outstanding. He certainly him and Michael Vaughan got the best out of me, and and that's when I had, you know, the greatest times in in an England shirt. Yeah, oh seven and oh eight. That series against New Zealand was in each Test match you got a five for. You were roasted. Was it number six in the world? Named in the oh. test team in the year. How was that as a golden period in your career? I mean, it, of course, you know, to you know, test team of the year and England player of the year. And of course, look, they're all really lovely and and the how, you know, they'll always live long in the memory. Um, but uh, again, actually, I was in, we were in Sri Lanka um, pre-Christmas and we toured Sri Lanka and I bowled probably the best I've ever bowled in an England shirt. And I think I came away with six wickets in the Test Series. I mean, I did well in the one day, but in the Test Series, I bowled beautiful and hardly took a wicket. And, and it just shows we went to New Zealand and I was still very confident. But people won't remember Sri Lanka. They'll go, oh, we only got six wickets. But actually, it just shows the confidence you can you can take on from, from maybe bowling well, you know, even if you didn't take the wickets. And New Zealand, it, would just, it just sort of clicked. And, you know, I felt in good rhythm and I carried on from, from the Sri Lanka Series and, I suppose it, you know, it was a nice tour to be on and take all those wickets. How do you reflect back on your 22 Test match career? Obviously, as we mentioned, starts off with the one you had the gap, and then to come and with and rise to number six in the world. How would you reflect at your time? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm chuffed. I think I had a decent England career. I, I was sort of at the back end of my career when I played for England again. You know, I, I hope that people enjoy, you know, I swung the ball. I, I gave everything for for the three lines and, I, you know, I, I took a few wickets. Um, I actually probably, if anything, I probably should have played a few more tests. You know, left armour, you look at all left armours now in the world, you know, you've got a lot of 
teams all have to play left arm because of the variation and the swing. You know, I was still swinging the ball and, you know, I probably should have played a few more. But again, pace came into it and he was like, pace was all the fashion um, rather than actually swinging, pitching the ball, swinging, troubling the batsman. But look, no regrets whatsoever. You know, I, I enjoyed it absolutely every minute. And and when I went out there, I think people could probably say, you know, I, I, I really tried my best and gave it everything. And then that World T20 success in yes. 2010. How was that as a journey, as a team? And then talk us through specifically the final and your mindset going into like a World Cup final as well. It's yeah, I mean, the dressing room. Yeah, I'm, 2009, we were rubbish. You know, on home soil, we got uh, beaten by Holland comfortably. Um, but yeah, that that whole experience, we we were underdogs. We weren't given any chance after 2009, um, but we had a really strong team, really strong one-day team. We were really confident. You know, we all knew our roles in the side and we, we batted every team, really. Uh, you know, and then going into the final, we were really confident. You know, you don't want to, whatever game you play, you don't want to go into a game and go, we're going to win. But this game, I, I just, I don't know, on the coach going to the ground, you, you looked around and we were just oozing confidence. And, and we we played like it, didn't we? I mean, it what you know, what a what a World Cup we had as a team, and and to beat Australia in the final, you know, again, you know, be the first team to win a World Cup in a long, long time, and you know, for England especially, so it was absolutely awesome. You know, the celebrations were awesome. Actually, the batting when we were batting, me and Graham Swan didn't watch. We were sat in the toilet talking to each other. We were so nervous. Um, but we chased it down comfortably in the end. And I think we, you know, you could hear the noise in the toilet when it was a four or a six or if it was a wicket. And we just ran out. At, I think it was over 18 and we were, um, we knew we were home and hosed by then. So we, yeah, I mean, it was immense. Absolutely amazing. What was your mindset when it going into like a big game such as that? Did you, did you feel the nerves? Was it just soul focus or did you like to kind of, did you seek out distractions just to calm yourself down? What was your kind of? How did you approach big games? I mean, yeah, World Cup final. Look, I, I think if you don't, if you're not nervous, then you're not. I don't think you're ready. Um, I think nerves is good. Um, obviously, you don't want massive nerves, but yeah, I was all nerve, every game. I was always nervous. You know, until you bowl that first delivery, you know, you, you are the butterflies are going, the adrenaline's going. Um, but I generally would again harping back to train, I would make sure my training was spot on the day before or the or the day before that, that I was ready. So going into that game, yes, you have the nerves, but I knew I was ready to play. Um, but we, you know, when you're singing the national anthem in front of 10,000 Barmy Army English fans, um, the nerves tend to disappear. So in the final, I didn't really have many nerves after that. That's an opening bowler. In both when you're when you're with the red ball and the white ball, how do you obviously you must be given the box to actually choose the ball? What kind of stuff did you look look for? Did you just pick it up? Is it the seam, the feel in the hand? There's no exact science behind it. So, but no, there isn't. What was your thoughts? I, I for, so for a red ball, I would look at smooth and and dark and and fairly small in the hand with a with a decent seam. Um, if the ball was bitty, I, the leather wasn't great. Whereas if it was smooth, I thought it would shine up. And um, so that was for the red ball. For white ball, I mean, at the start, when white balls were first, kookaburras were introduced, they used to swing around a lot. And I think they kind of cottoned on to the fact that there was a lot of low scores and we wanted to entertain in, in one day cricket. So the white balls... I, again, I just went for smooth and, and small and, and tried to get a decent seam on it. Um, I wouldn't overthink it, but I think generally bowlers have the same ideas of having a decent seam and, and a smooth-looking ball. And when you reflect back on your career, did you think your game was more suited to the longer form test or in the county four-day game or the shorter one-day T20 format? It's, it's weird because, again, evolution, I, at first, I've played a lot of county cricket and uh, one day cricket, I bowled at the death. But I think county cricket was stronger. A lot of people wanted, you know, test cricket was huge in my early 20s. Then one day picked up with, you know, coloured clothing and um, more razzmatazz. And then as T20 came in, I had to sort of change. I think I became both for, for a while. 
you know, I really worked hard on my one day. You know, I bowled at the death a lot. I enjoy bowling at the death because you can be, a, you know, hero or, or a villain. And then later on in my career, I, it's tough, you know, the body, I couldn't have played all formats. So the one format I loved was the longer format, you know, the the battle between ball and ball and bat and, and you know, thinking the batsman out, you know, having a look at what's his weak areas, how are you going to get him out? And I, you know, you look at this test match again, you know, India and Australia, it's been thrilling, hasn't it? You know, the Pujara and Cummins battle, you know, on the last day was... That is test cricket for me, and that is what I loved. I love being in the in the battle. You know, T20 cricket, yes, look, it's here to stay. It's brilliant. It's a spectator sport. I mean, the shots and the ball, the techniques and the skills of batters and bowlers and fielding is, is amazing. But I think 2020 players sometimes are now 10 a penny. There's so many. Everyone wants to play 2020 cricket. Whereas for me, I view the best players play test cricket and one day cricket. You know, to, to bat for a day and get 140, for me, that is awesome. You know, to go out and swing and, and get three top edges and get, you know, 18 off three balls. Okay, yeah, look, that's great. But for me, you know, taking five wickets, bowling 26 overs in, you know, 90 degree heat, that, that is, for me, that is a skill in itself, mentally, physically. Um, technically. And then 2010, you win your third championship overall, the second with knots. And talk us through the move back to Yorkshire. How did that all come about? Yeah, again, weirdly enough, I I was going to retire from te- from international cricket um, and then knots only offered me a one-year deal. Um, and at the time, I thought, you know, I, w- I was in good form, playing well, I was still really fit. Um, and, I, and I thought that I had a lot more to offer um, I was still in really good rhythm. I was still bowling well. And not so, I was, you know, I was really surprised, you know, offering me a one year deal. And, you know, I just, I thought I'd test the water and, and see what else was out there. You know, if a new challenge came around, then great. And I was offered four years by a lot of counties and, you know, to have the opportunity to go back to Yorkshire. And in a way, I had unfinished business, um, you know, leaving maybe early in, in my career and um, so to go back to Yorkshire knowing that Yorkshire had these you know Rue, Bairstow, Live, Balance um, you know a lot of young talented players who were I knew were going to get better and better and I think Yorkshire you know if they improved and signed a few more bowlers we had an opportunity to win the championship and we you know it was a great move for me to go back and, and do well for the club my home yeah. county as it were. Yeah it was a back-to-back championships 14 14- and 15, how do they rank uh, in amongst in amongst the five? Yeah, I mean, to win back-to-back titles is not easy. It's not been done very often, you know, especially, you know, the last sort of 40, 50 years. We, again, weirdly disappoint, you know, I've no regrets in cricket, but I, I thought we should have won probably four in a row. We should have been the best team to ever play county cricket. I don't think many teams, have, I think Yorkshire in the 60s maybe won three in a row. Um, and we should have done if we'd have just played well in a couple more games each year. We would have cruised the championship, and again, that's the beauty. You know, we we should have, could have, would have, um, but it wasn't meant to be. But you know, to win two in a row, I mean, is, is a great effort. How did you keep the standards so high? Was it just the influence of you know, kind of the experienced players such as yourself, um, the, the balance between those guys and like the youngsters coming through? We had a, yeah, again, really good point. We had a fine balance. We had a quite probably 56% real experienced players and then some young, talented players. But we had players that had been around quite some time now and probably needed to um, just stamp their authority a little bit more. And I think also the count championships that I've won, the team comes to mind. We had great team spirit. The team ethics were spot on. You know, we stuck together. We looked after one another. The communication within the team. And, and also with that comes a very happy team. And we had fun. Uh, and we, you know, we when you're enjoying your cricket and you're playing well as a team, it, it's amazing you you win games where you possibly shouldn't. And, and we did that regular just because we really enjoyed it. We had a great team spirit. And then when retirement came from the game, 
were you ready for it mentally? And also, I know you had a bit of involvement with Surrey within in, in the coaching side in their in their title winning side. How did that all come about as well? That path into yes, yeah, so I retired um, 2017. Um, you know what? I probably could have played a couple more years. I was still bowling just as well as I had done, but the body was sort of giving up then. You know, little more injuries were coming in, and and also they were lasting longer because of my age and. Um, I just had enough then, I think. Um, then Alex Stewart just rang me. It was weird because I, I always said to myself, you know, playing 22 years as a pro, I thought, you know what, I'd like six months off and, and just spend time with the family and do very much and eat chocolate and eat loads of rubbish, go to McDonald's all the time and do what I'd never really done. Um, but then Alex Stewart rang me and just said, look, we our bowling coach has left and would you consider coming down and just being a consultant for the four days? And, you know, I jumped to the chance to get, you know, first experience, you know, mixing with Alex Stewart and Michael DiVenuto and learning a new trade, um, you know, for them sorry, to win a championship. You know, me going there, is, it was weird. Yeah, it was, it was brilliant. And I mean, the cricket, again, the cricket was sort of how Yorkshire and Notts, when we'd won championships, it was exactly the same. The, the team environment and the way the cricket that they played and it was exciting. They had five bowlers who could take wickets on, on any pitch. And yeah, it was it was awesome. It, it really was, and it was a great experience. And how did Dancing on Ice come about? Um, after? Got to mention yeah, it. So half, halfway through Surrey, um, I got a call from my agent sort of saying, would you be interested in in going um, on the show? And I'd, I'd never ice skated ever in my entire life before. Um, so I said, yeah, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll go. You know, I met the producers and, um, one of the pro skaters literally just flung me around on the ice for 20 minutes and thought, oh, well, it doesn't matter. I just had a you know a brief chat with him. And they rang a week later and said, we'd love to have Ryan on the show. And I was like, whoops. And I just, I dropped my shopping. I was like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do now? And you know what? It's, again, amazing experience. Met some amazing people and had so much fun. It was it was weird because I'm, I'm just, you know, I just see myself as a cricketer who, you know, trying my best. I'm a, I'm a Yorkshire lad. And we all met up the first night to have sort of two days together. And I'm at the bar with a pussycat doll, Brian McFadden from Westlife, Gemma Collins. I'm like, what on earth am I, what am I doing here? What? This is weird. But, you know, I had so much fun. It was, it was brilliant. And, you know, even though I was in the bottom two, four times, I, I think I managed to get to week seven. So I did all right. No, you do. You do much better than I would have ever done. So, <laughs> uh, so just to end on, what does the future hold for Ryan Sybottom? Do you want to still be involved in the county game in terms of coaching? What? what how do How do the future years hold for you? Look for you. Yeah. Ho well, hopefully, I'll be in the jungle at some point. Uh, I wouldn't say no. Say no. Yeah, I think. Look, my bread and butter is cricket. And I still, like I said, I still do a little bit of coaching, you know, for the younger age groups up and where I am. Um, but I'd love to, you know, be involved in some capacity uh, further down the line in the, you know, whether it be the county game or internationally. You know, that's what I love. Um, you know, I love the game of cricket. It's given me so much enjoyment. So, yeah, hopefully down the line I'll be coaching some team, whether it be abroad or in this country. Perfect. Ryan. Thank you very much for your time Pleasure. today. Really appreciate it. Great Thank insight you. to your career and all the best for the months ahead. Cheers. Thanks for asking me. Cheers, mate. So Neil Kagram, Cricket Last Stories, Ryan Sidebottom. Thank you.